to do almost anything really, really well, one of the keys is you need to know who to go to, who to learn from. If you ask my wife, Sherry, where do you find great recipes? If you want to learn to cook well, where do you go? I've heard her say it over the years many, many times. She would say, she's got a little secret. She said, go find church cookbooks. So what's that? Well, churches used to like get together and, and, and people could put a recipe in. But here's the thing. On the cookbook with your recipe goes your name. You get one recipe. No one's giving their crummy recipes. They're giving their best recipe because their name is on it. And Sherry's got a, a stack of church cookbooks because if she, we're visiting a church and they have a cookbook, she'll get it because she knows it's going to be filled with good recipes. If you say to me, hey, Kevin, where do you go for medical advice? I've got a good friend, Rick Alexander, Dr. Alexander. He actually is the vice president of the board of this church. And, and Rick Alexander, I, I remember, I just, I didn't know you were here. I just, I just caught Rick's eye. Uh, when my mom was drawing near the end of her life and going through some really tough times, I called Rick. He, he knew more and gave me better direction from a distance on the phone than the doctors did at the hospital. He knew more. He goes, that, that, he was like, he knew what was going on. When my dad was going through different times, he gave me insight and gave me some peace of knowing what was going on. You got to know who to go to on almost any topic. If you want to know how to pray, I mean, if you really want to go deep in prayer and pray well and pray powerfully, who do you go to? You go to Jesus. You learn from Jesus. And so John chapter 17 that we're spending last week and this week and next weekend, it's all one prayer. It's the largest prayer of Jesus. We call this big prayers because it's a, the biggest prayer of Jesus in the Bible, and it's also a big prayer. He's praying for big things. And we can learn to pray by watching the master prayer. And I'll tell you something, in the Bible, you always have to understand context. And if you say, well, you know, what, what's happening before and after this big prayer of Jesus? I want to take note of what's happening right afterwards. The, the first line of the prayer in John 17 is the introduction. The entire rest of the chapter is the prayer. And then in chapter 18 of John, verse 1, this is what we read. When he had finished praying, so we know it's the next moment. Now watch this now. When he had finished praying this prayer that we're studying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. You know what that garden was? That was the garden where the crowd came and arrested Jesus. From there, he went through a series of mock trials. And from there, he was nailed to a cross for our sins. This is Jesus' prayer right before he went to the cross. And he was not only praying for us, he was teaching us to pray. This prayer really kind of walks through three movements of this prayer. The first movement we looked at last week was he prays for the glory of the Father, a great place to begin with your prayers. But then he prays for his followers, for his disciples. A theologians have a term called telescoping, and that is the, in the initial context it had meaning, but that meaning telescopes out into, into the future. So when Jesus prayed this prayer, he was praying for the disciples right there, but that goes on outward to those who would become his disciples. That means Jesus is praying for you if you're a Christian. If you are a follower of Jesus, this is his prayer for you. But also, it's a prayer teaching you how to pray for other Christians, we just prayed today for Carmel Press Church and, and, and Pastor Tim Yee, who's a good friend of mine. As a matter of fact, we'll be having an In-N-Out Burger together right here at Shoreline with five pastors in the area this Thursday, hanging out together. Uh, and so when we pray for, for Pastor Tim, I'm praying for a friend, for a brother. You know, and, and some people say, well, wait, wait, you pray for and hang out with other pastors of other local churches? They're the competition. It's like, no, they're not. Every church has competition. It's called the forces of hell. And we have partners in that competition, and it's called other churches. And we pray for them, and we lift them up, and we walk in community with them. So here's what I want you to do as we begin the message today. As we, we're going to read every verse, every line of Jesus' prayer. As a matter of fact, I've got four different members of our church who are going to come up and actually read some of the scriptures and then lead us in prayer out of the heart of Jesus. I want to invite you not just to listen to these prayers, but, but to join into these prayers. But, but what I want us to do today is to learn from Jesus and then begin praying for other people, particularly today for other Christians. So would you think of one or two Christians right now that you love, that you care about? Could be a family member, a friend, a neighbor, someone in the church, somebody in another church. Could be a pastor of a church on the other side of the planet. But would you say, Lord, today teach me to pray more powerfully for other Christians. And as we go through this message, think of those one or two people. And Jesus, this is our prayer as we learn to pray from you. 
deep in our prayer lives. And I pray, Lord, that, that these 10 different ideas, these 10 different truths, 10 different ways that you prayed for us, for your disciples, may we learn to pray like that, to pray like you for other people. Speak your truth to us, Lord. Teach us to pray. We pray this in your name and for your glory. Amen. Well, we're going to walk through these 10 different kind of movements of prayer or things that Jesus prayed about. If you're thinking, man, I, I want to remember these things so I can pray these for others, all you need to do is go on the Shoreline website, and every week on the website, if you go to uh, our weekly reading guide, which is our weekly resources, to, you know, reflection questions, and we have stuff every week we create to help you discuss and think about what we've learned, and in there, if you click on the sermon notes, you'll actually find my entire sermon printed out for you. You so you put that on the website before you preach it? Yes, because I'm not faking it. I actually know where I'm going, mostly. And, uh, <laughs> and so, uh, but, but that, if you want to remember these 10 things, don't feel like you have to memorize them all right now. Also, if you open up your Shoreline app, you can take notes in there and keep it yourself. But if you don't remember these things, go back. And I, I encourage you to put that in your phone so when you're praying for someone, you can actually use this, use Jesus' prayer guide as your prayer guide for other, uh, other Christians. So here's the first thing we learned from Jesus. To pray for faithful obedience to God's word. Jesus models for us that we need to pray that other Christians and that we should have faithful obedience to God's word. So this prayer begins in verse 6 of John chapter 17. And so as, as Tom reads this portion of the prayer, listen to it, but also hear the heart of Jesus praying for you and teaching you to pray for others. Let's hear these words from, from John 17, 6. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me. And they have obeyed your word. As Jesus is praying, he's saying, I'm thinking of those, Father, that you've given me, his disciples, his followers, and they have obeyed your word. Jesus celebrates when his people follow his word. Obedience to the scriptures, knowing them and following them, changes us, honors God, and impacts the world. You want to see the world transformed. Learn to, to, to live in such a way that Jesus would say, and they have obeyed my word. Does Jesus pray that of you, and you have obeyed my word? So let's join our hearts together and pray that we would be people who will follow the word of God. Oh, Heavenly Father, we were yours. What, what an assurance that is. We were always yours. We thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus, to reveal yourself to us. Lord, Lord, we see how those who followed Jesus heard your word, and then they believed in it. We know they didn't have it all figured out, but they believed you and trusted you, and so obeyed your word. Holy Spirit, that's what we want. Help us. Help us to trust in God and to honor the Father by, by first knowing your word, but then obeying it in our lives more and more each day. And Lord, we don't just pray that for the easy stuff, but for the hard stuff, uh, for the uncomfortable things, and, and not just for ourselves, but for others. And this is what we pray in your name. Yes. Amen. Amen. Jesus praises the Father, saying, and they have obeyed your word. When I was 15 years old, when I became a Christian, I don't think I'd ever held a Bible. We didn't have Bibles in my home. If we did, it was on a shelf like any other book. It wasn't, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. And I became a Christian, and somebody gave me a Revised Standard Version Harper Study Bible with study notes by Harold Lenzel. And they actually said to me, this is God's word, you're supposed to read it. It's about this thick because it had all the study notes in it. And I began to dig into God's word. And almost every single day when I read it, I saw things in me that didn't line up with the Bible. I mean, I, I grew up in a, as a pretty rough kid in a non-believing home, and I had to make a decision. It's the same decision every one of us has to make every time we open this book. And that is, there's really two ways to handle the Bible. There's two primary ways. One's the wrong way, and one's the right way. I'll start with the wrong way, okay? Here's one way people handle the Bible. I will decide how I want to live, and what I want to do, and how I want to see the world, and I'll get my worldview, and I'll decide who I'm going to do, and, what I, and I will then go to the Bible and find the things that agree with me, ignore the things that don't agree with me, and maybe twist some things so they make, so they sound like I'm right. There's people that approach the Bible that way. I need to make it fit my life. That's not the way to come at the Bible. That's not what Jesus is commending here. They obeyed his word. Here's the second way to handle the Bible. I come to the word of God. I believe it's breathed by the spirit of God and it's true. So every time I read it, 
if my life doesn't align with it, if my kids or family members or friends' lives don't align with it. I'm going to be loving and caring, but I'm, I'm not going to change my views because the world doesn't like them. I'm going to shape my life to this book, not try to shape this book to my life. Is everybody following me? And Jesus celebrates that his followers obeyed his word. James, in the book of James, said, don't be just a hearer of the word, deceiving yourself, tricking yourself. He says, but do what it says. He says, you're kidding, your, James says, you're kidding yourself if all you do is read the Bible and don't live out what it says. We need to do what it says. So as you pray for yourself, and as you pray for other Christians, would you pray, help us know your word, love your word, and follow your word every day of our lives. Now, Jesus continues on in this prayer. Here's the second thing we learned from Jesus. Pray for growing and bold faith in Jesus. Pray that your faith and the faith of other Christians would become bolder and bolder as time goes by. Listen to Jesus pray in verses 7 and 8. Remember, this is all his prayer for his disciples, for us, if you're a follower of Jesus. Now, they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. Jesus says, my followers accepted my words. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. They knew with certainty who Jesus was. We have to live with that bold faith. We need to pray, Lord, let my faith in you, Jesus, be so rock solid that whatever comes my way, I hold to you, Jesus. Wait, wait a minute. You, wait, you believe that some guy who died 2,000 years ago came back to life again? You, you believe that? What, you, you believe that? Do you believe that? Yes. Do you believe that? Because yes. people are going to ask, wait, 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 some guy who died 2,000 years ago and you say rose again, that that washed all your, if that could wash all your wrongs and sins, like psh, they're, go they're gone? You believe that? Yes. Wait, you believe that? Yes. You, Jesus is saying these, these disciples knew what they believed about him with certainty, with confidence. Do you believe what the Bible teaches? Do you believe what the Bible says about Jesus? Because if you don't, we got a problem. <laughs> If I don't believe what the Bible teaches, if I don't believe what it says about Jesus, I'm going golfing. I'm not preparing sermons every week and coming here to talk. If I don't believe this, what are we doing, right? And so Jesus says, they knew with certainty who I was, and they held to it. Will you pray for your faith and the faith of other Christians to become rock solid? Because we are in a time where there's going to be more and more and more pushback against what we say we believe. We need to say, Jesus is my Savior. He's the one who saves me and cleanses me. He is my Lord. He's the leader of my life. If it comes down to me trusting what Jesus says or trusting what you say, whoever you are, singular or plural, you, whoever you are, if it comes to trusting what Jesus says or what you say, they say, I'm going with what Jesus says every time. Lord, give me the faith and the boldness to hold to that. I remember sitting with my little brother, Jason, uh, in, in, a, in my car, we lived in Michigan at the time, and I told Jason, this is, a, this is a time where he was kind of, he was sort of an atheist agnostic at the time, and my whole family was raised in an atheistic agnostic kind of worldview, but uh, I was already a Christian, I was a pastor, he was still kind of living that kind of life. I told him, Jason, I'll fly you out to Michigan anytime you want to come out, I'll pay your way, but you need to know when you come, we're going to talk about Jesus. And he wanted to come and visit and hang out, and we had, we had some great talks about Jesus. But I remember sitting in my car one time, and, and I, I said, Jason, I said, you need to know something about my faith in Jesus. I said, I believe in Jesus more than I believe in you. I said, you're going to get on a plane tomorrow and you're going to fly back to California. I will question your existence before I question the existence of Jesus because he's with me every moment all the time and you're going to be gone by tomorrow. That, and that was one of the things. He's now a worship leader in a church and has six great kids who are growing to love and follow Jesus and God transformed his life. But one of the things that, that woke him up to that was just looking and saying, that his brother actually believes this stuff. You believe that? Absolutely, with all my heart. And then talk with people about it. But we need to know what we believe, and Jesus prays that we would have growing and bold faith in him. Third, we pray for Jesus to be glorified in their life. Jesus prayed these words. I pray for them. 
I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. Listen to this. And glory has come to me through them. Jesus says to the Father, glory has come to me through my disciples, through my followers. Do you understand that as a, if you're a Christian, for those of you that have made a commitment to Jesus, not only do you glorify Jesus, but you actually bring glory to him, that your life can bring, that Jesus looks at you and says, you have brought glory to me. When we walk with him, when we love him, when we follow him, Jesus takes delight. The glory of Jesus should be the consuming passion of every Christian. We should be consumed. Jesus, may you be glorified in my life. May you be glorified with the words that I speak, with my attitudes, with my motives. Jesus, be glorified in my life. And will you begin to pray for other Christians here in our community, friends and family, Christians around the world. Jesus, be glorified in the lives of your people. He prayed celebrating the fact that he can be glorified in our lives. And then Jesus continues on. Fourth, he teaches this, to pray for protection from the things of this world. Jesus, Jesus wants us to be protected. If you are his follower, he wants to protect you from the things in this world. So as he continues to pray in verse 11, Jesus is praying for your protection, for our protection. Listen and join into this prayer of Jesus in John 17, 11. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Here's Jesus' prayer for you. Father, protect them by the power of your name. That's power. That's protection. Our Heavenly Father and the authority of His name has more power than we dream, more power than we can imagine. And so let's join our hearts together. Let's pray for God's protection, God's power over us and other people who love Jesus that we know and that we care about. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Jesus, you are no longer here with us in the flesh, but you have left us the power of your name and the Holy Spirit for protection. We take such comfort that you did not leave us alone and powerless. But still, we face so much that is hard from the things of this world. Destruction, sickness, death, fear, anxiety, and all kinds of brokenness. Your word says that in this world we will have trouble, but to take heart because you have overcome the world. So we do take heart, Jesus, because in your name and in your power, we will be protected from the power of sin and death. Yours is the victory, and we thank you for our ultimate protection, everlasting life with you. Amen. Amen. Jesus, protect us from the enemy, protect us from temptation. We need to be praying that for ourselves, and we need to pray that for other Christians. What Christians do you carry in your heart? Pray for God's protection over them from temptation of the enemy. I mean, if you think, well, the enemy's not going to try to attack me or attack them, just go back and read Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4. You know what happens there? The enemy tries to tempt Jesus. <laughs> if the enemy tried to tempt Jesus, you better know he's going to try to tempt you and me. So let's pray for God's protection. Lord, protect us from being shaped into the mold of this culture. We're told not to let this culture shape us, but we're in a time right now, man, th th these 80 kids that just went off today, I got a chance to pray over them and pray for them before they left at 8 o'clock this morning from here to go, to go up to Hume Lake. But we need to pray for the next generation, these middle school, high school kids who are just being inundated with a culture who says, man, if you're a Christian, what you believe, it's not real, it doesn't make sense, it's a joke, it's oppressive, it's hate-filled, it's not the hope for unity, the hope for justice, the hope for life in this world is Jesus. And the very one who can help us, often people will say, he's the one who you have to stay away from. Let's pray for the next generation. Lord, protect them, watch over them. And then Jesus continues on in this beautiful, powerful prayer. In verses 11 and 12, we're encouraged to pray for absolute and unbending unity with God's people. Do you, know, do you know that Jesus prayed that we would walk in unity with other Christians, all Christians? So listen to this prayer and let your heart join in. We're going to step back to verse 11 and then ramp up and read through verse 12. Listen to the prayer of Jesus. He prays, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. 
And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, Jesus prayed, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None of them has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. Listen to the prayer of Jesus. So that they may be one as we are one. Who's Jesus talking to? Who's Jesus praying to? The Father. So what's his prayer? Father, may they, my people, my disciples, be one as you, Father, and I are one. How unified are God the Father and God the Son? Perfectly. How unified are we as God's people? Not quite as perfectly. <laughs> We're not quite there. I mean, how, how's that going? Perfect unity with every other Christian that you know. That's the prayer of Jesus. That's the heart of Jesus. Our level of unity should look like Trinitarian unity. That's the prayer of Jesus. Will you begin to pray passionately? Lord, let me walk in unity with other Christians. Anyone who believes the word of God, who believes in Jesus Christ by faith, let me walk in unity with them. You start praying that way, God may point out someone in your heart who's a Christian that you're not getting along with, and God, the Spirit, might convict you and say, it's time to make that right. It's time to try to restore that. We want to walk in unity with God's people. It's one of the reasons why we partner with other churches in our community, because we need to walk in unity with, with, with Calvary Church down the street over here. And we need to walk in unity with Cypress Church down at Highway 68, and walk in unity with Monterey Church down on Alvarado Street, and walk in unity with, with Carmel Press Church. And, and just, we need to walk in unity with God's people. Let's pray for that, and strive for that, and work towards that. And then Jesus continues praying in verse 13. And here's the sixth thing we learn about prayer by following the example of Jesus. Pray for full and overflowing joy. Jesus prays that you, as a follower of Jesus, would be filled with his joy to the point of overflowing. Listen to this prayer of Jesus in verse 13. I am coming to you. It should be on. Yeah. Up, and then they'll take care of it. There it is. Yeah. Hi, guys. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. So that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Pause and think about this for a minute. Jesus is praying that his disciples will have his full measure of joy. How good does that sound? The overflowing measure of joy that comes from Jesus. And, and so we need to understand that that's the heart of Jesus. We can cry out for believers to experience growing levels of joy no matter what they face, in the good times and in the tough times. We need to pray, Lord, let your joy overflow. The Apostle Paul, when he was in the, in, in the jail in the city of Philippi, after having been publicly be beaten, falsely accused, and thrown in jail, has a praise service, celebrates God's good, not because he was beat up, not because he was in jail, but because Jesus was with him. So let's join our hearts in prayer right now together. And I've, I've asked Dana. Dana has a unique role here at Shoreline. She's, she's the only one um, up here that's, that's officially on kind of full-time staff at Shoreline. But Dana helps in our communications and in, in our, you know, connecting our English-speaking, Spanish-speaking ministries. And so th this last Easter, during the third service, we had Spanish translation. This last Easter, we had three of our Spanish-speaking congregation make a first-time commitment to Jesus Christ. So God's doing great work in our Spanish-speaking part of our congregation. But Dana actually kind of helps bridge those two. So I've asked Dana if she would pray right now in English, and then if she'd also pray that same prayer in Spanish uh, so that our Spanish speakers don't have to have a translation. They can just listen to it in their own language. So Dana, would you lead us in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for the joy of your son, Jesus. Thank you for the church and the world we live in and the blessings that are given to us every day. We pray for the joy to be fulfilled in you and by you. In Jesus' name. Padre Dios, gracias por el gozo de tu Hijo Jesús. Gracias por la iglesia y por el mundo que vivimos y las bendiciones que son cada día. Oremos para que la iglesia se realice en ti y por ti. En el nombre de Jesús. Amen. Amen. Will you commit to pray for yourself as a disciple, if you're a Christian, and for other Christians you know, for overflowing joy, joy in the wonderful times, joy in the difficult times, and joy that's so real that the world sees. 
If your joy is real in the, in the wonderful times, and if your joy is real in the painful times, the world will see Jesus. They'll want to know what's going on, and that opens the door to be a witness for him. And then Jesus continues to pray. A seventh lesson we can learn about prayer. Prayer for power to live for Jesus in this broken world. When Jesus prays, he doesn't pray that God would kind of pluck us out of this world, but he prays that we would be his presence in the world. So look with me at verses 14 and 15, and listen to these scriptures as they're read, and hear these as the prayer of Jesus for us. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Listen to the prayer of Jesus. My prayer is not that you take them out of this world, but Lord, keep your hand upon us, your people. We need to pray that we can be in the world, but not shaped by the world. That we would be world shapers and world impactors, not shaped by the world. So let's join our hearts in prayer together and ask God to help us really understand what it means to be in the world, but not of the world, and impact in this world. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Dear Father, grant us courage, compassion, and power to live in this broken world. Make us vessels of redemption where light penetrates darkness and lost souls are rescued. Through your word, we recognize the more we become like you, Jesus, the more we will be hated by this world. So we pray that we will not become discouraged nor corrupted by the world's sin, but instead, Be a witness to your glory. Protect us from the evil one. We ask that the work of your Holy Spirit conforms us into your likeness. Use us in your mighty power. Amen. Amen. We need to be praying that we would not be pulled out of the world, but that we would be God's light and God's salt in this world. That's what Jesus wants from us. You think about it. If you had a room like this where the lights are up, and you lit a candle in the middle of the room, you'd hardly notice the candle because there's light in the room. You dim the lights to kind of half level, and you'd kind of go, oh, that's pretty. It's kind of pretty and glowy. You'd see it, but you put this place pitch black, and you light one candle, and you go, whoa. It's just it, It sort of emanates through the room. As our world gets darker, let's not have an escapist attitude. God, get me out of here. You feel that sometimes, don't you? I've had it, right? But to say, God, I'm not praying that you take me out of the world. I'm praying you protect me from the evil one and let me be your person in this world. And pray that for other Christians and watch God answer that prayer. And Jesus continues to pray. Uh, Pray for power over the evil one, for protection and power. And all through the scriptures, we're, we're taught that there's a real enemy, a real battle going on. And so Jesus prays. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you Protect them from the evil one. We need to pray for eyes to see his tactics and faith to resist his temptations. We need to say, Lord, give me eyes to see the tactics of the enemy and faith and power to resist. Lord, protect me, but also empower me. And we need to pray that. In Ephesians chapter 6, we read about the, the defensive armor he says, you know, it, it talks about take, you take the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, and it goes through all the protective gear, but then it says, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and then it says, pray at all times in the Spirit. The Apostle Paul says there's defensive things we need to have to, to not be attacked by the enemy, but there's also offensive things that we use to fight against the enemy. If you think about any sport, if you, if you are in any sport and you have the best defense in the world and zero offense. The best you will ever do is a tie at 0-0. Zero, zero. Well, we defended ourselves. They never scored on us. Yeah, but you got no offense. You never scored. Jesus wants us to pray for ourselves and for other Christians to, to know the protection of God, but also the power of God. And we're not called just to, to kind of defend the gates. We're called to storm the gates of hell in the name of Jesus in love, in grace, in truth, in gentleness, and sometimes in firmness. But we stand and we spiritually fight back. We push back against the work of the enemy. Jesus calls us to pray for power over the evil one. Pray for eyes to see his tactics, faith to resist his temptation. And then, 
A ninth lesson, pray for understanding of and obedience to God's word. Jesus comes back to the topic of his word again because it's so important for us to be able to stand and live in this world. So look with me at verse 16 and verse 17. Jesus prays of his disciples then and of the disciples today. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. This world is not ultimately our home. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Lord, sanctify us, transform us, change us by your word. Your word is truth. We need to pray for commitment to read, understand, and follow what the Bible teaches. Every one of us needs to pray and say, Lord, let this word, let your book become part of my life. There's a reason why every week of the year and every day of the year at Shoreline, we provide a Bible reading for you. It's on the website. It's on our Shoreline app. If you don't have the Shoreline app, get the Shoreline app today. If you, if you don't ever go to the website, you can pull it up. But we have a, a Bible reading for every day. And if you do those seven Bible readings through the week, by the next Sunday, you're all ready for the sermon. Why? Because we pick passages to get you ready for next Sunday's sermon. So you can be immersed in God's word. And then when you hear the word preached, you're like, oh man, this is coming alive. I want to challenge you to open this book, to learn from this book, to make it a part of your daily life. Uh, when I became a Christian, I didn't know the Bible at all. People, when I first became a Christian, people said, well, like, you know, like, the story of David and Goliath, right? I'm like, no. Tell me about it. Sounds interesting. You said, well, you can't, you can't have got through your whole life and not heard that one. I didn't hear it. I didn't hear any Bible stories growing up. But since I became a Christian, since I was given a Bible, I've walked into this journey of just trying every day to understand what it says and to follow it. And can I let you know a little secret? Can I, as your pastor, can I tell you something? There are a lot of days when I read this book God shows something in my attitude that's not quite right yet that needs to change. He shows something in my lifestyle that needs to be adjusted to his will that's not where he wants it to be. So wait, but you're our pastor. You're perfect. Eh, wrong. Uh, no, I'm not. Again and again. There's times where I'll read something in the Bible and God will convict me of something and I'll, and I'll kind of quietly pray, Lord, why didn't you tell me that like 30 years ago? He says, well, because I was working on like 25 other problems you had. You know, I, we're, 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 now, now it's time for this one. Does anybody else know, know what I'm talking about? Anybody follow? Am I alone here? Please don't leave me hanging. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, God, I'm still learning things from God's word. It's true. It's powerful. And then finally, Jesus teaches to pray for passionate engagement in the mission of Jesus. That we need to have a passionate engagement in the call, the mission of Jesus. So Jesus is praying right before he goes to the garden, gets arrested, goes through these fake trials, and goes to the cross to die for us. Right before that, he's praying for us. And he ends this prayer with these words in verse, verses 18 and 19. Jesus prays to the Father, as you, Father, sent me into the world, I have sent them. He's talking about you. I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus prayed, as you sent me into the world, Father, I have sent them into the world. May we see the world as you do, Lord, and love the lost with your heart. Let that be your prayer. Do you know that you're sent into this world as a bearer of the goodness? If you are a Christian, whether you're 15 or 55 or 95, it doesn't matter. If you're a Christian, God sends you into the world just like the Father sent him into the world. Has that ever struck you before in that passage? Father, as you sent me into the world, so I send them. He's talking about his disciples. Will you say every day, Lord, this day, send me into your world. The presence of Jesus, a lover of Jesus, a bearer of the name of Jesus. Make me more like him. Let me love like him, serve like him. Tell his story. Share my stories. Organically, naturally, not in your face, not forcing it. But man, when you live for Jesus and follow him, people want to know more about your life. Be ready to tell your story. Here's my encouragement today, that you not just hear this message, but that you say, okay, these 10 things that Jesus prayed for his disciples, Lord, teach me to pray it for myself, teach me to pray it for other Christians, and watch what Jesus does through those prayers. Lord Jesus, we pray together that you'll teach us to pray with greater passion, with greater frequency with greater focus and intentionality, and with greater effectiveness and power as you move through us. Jesus, thank you that even now you continue to intercede for us. And so we join you in prayer for ourselves and for every Christian we know to become more the people you want us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Hey, I want to send you off with a word of blessing, but before I do, a couple of quick things. Number one, next week things are going to change. 
Next week, you are more than welcome to wear a mask if you would like to, but no masks are required. So please feel free to not wear a mask anywhere on campus at all, and feel free to wear a mask the whole time. Totally up to you. Second, as you come into the worship center, a lot of the worship center will be just what we call open seating. Just come in and sit anywhere you want like we used to do as people. Just walk in and sit and see your friends. Hi, do you want to sit with me? Sit together. If you still want space, we're going to keep our little, sec- our little divider sections. And when you come in, simply say, hey, I'd like, I'd like um, social distancing. And we will, and, and online too, when you're ready to come back and be part of uh, joining with us in the worship center, um, we invite you to come. As lo- two months, two years, doesn't matter. As long as somebody says, I still need the space, we're going to provide that space. But for those who say, I don't need that anymore, no problem. If you don't wear a mask, no problem. It's totally up to you. Does that make sense? So that's, that starts next week. And then also, um, I want to let you know that uh, I, my, my training in prayer has been around, two people have taught me to pray, Jesus and Sherry Harney, my wife. Um, I have learned more about prayer from Sherry grew up in a home of prayer. And God, by God's grace, God gave her a chance to write this book, uh, Praying with Eyes Wide Open. It's, it, this is like 30 years of prayer lessons all in one book, and all the things I learned from Sherry, she shares with people just in this one book. So I've thought and prayed about this today. I didn't even ask Sherry permission before, but um, any, we have copies of this book available at a discounted rate out there in the lobby in the Connection Center. But if you can't afford a copy of this, just go and say, hey, i just like a copy of the book. They will give you one, and then Sherry and I are going to actually uh, work with the church, and we're going to make sure we pay for that. So anybody who wants one, it will be paid for. Does that make sense? So if you want to grow in prayer, this is a great tool. It's very readable, and it's just really powerful. So I encourage you to pick that up if you want to grow more in prayer. Um, I invite you to stand with me as, I, as, we, as we close our time. If you want prayer after the service, uh, we got a team right up here, three teams ready to pray for you. They love praying. They're good at it, so join them for prayer. Come in here from the connections, uh, from the uh, family worship venue and join us for prayer here. If you're online and you want prayer, call the number, and there's someone waiting to pray with you, or you can email in your prayer, and we'll put it on the prayer list to share it with our whole prayer team. And also, if you're online and you're new, text the word WELCOME to the number that you see under the word welcome, and we will connect with you and meet you and get to know you as best we can online. And if you're here in the worship center, just go right when you're done through the, connect, uh, through the, through the lobby to the connection center. They want to give you a gift and welcome you if you're new and just give you a warm welcome and thank you for coming to join us. As you go from this place, go knowing that Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, not only prayed for you, but the Bible says is still interceding on your behalf right now from heaven. Be assured of that. And grow in learning to pray like Jesus, with power, with passion for his glory. God bless you. Have a great week. And join us here next week as we gather together and talk about the last part of this big prayer of Jesus. God bless you. Have a great week.